Good morning, everyone. It is a blessing to be together this morning to worship the Lord. Approximately five years ago, somewhere back there, Marion and I were driving down Ramona Road, and and we pull into a friend of ours, Jake Stalsfus, lives just a mile from our house, and I've known him all, most of all my life. Pull in, and we're chatting with Jake, and Jake was just a, a very uh, upbeat Amish neighbor of mine, and he worked. Uh, help Anabaptist Financial with some of their planning wills and that what have you among the Amish. And he has, has his own business there at his place. And we got to talking about uh, his business and our business and our age, of course. And, and Jake told Marion and I, he said, or he asked us a question. He said, do you guys have an exit strategy? And I was like, we're like, no, you need an exit strategy. And okay, so... That got Marion and I to talking uh, about exit strategies, but little did we know that Jake's wife at that time had, we knew that she had a terminal illness, but within a year or so, Jake passed away suddenly. Uh, I believe a blood clot, a stroke, something like that, just died suddenly, unexpectedly. And it's like, whoa, I, I wonder if his exit strategy was in place because it, it happened really quick. And he's like our age. And... A year or so after that, his wife Mary also passed away, so they are both gone. And Mary and I are still working on our exit strategy, which I think is, is important and it is something we should be uh, thinking about and planning for. Now I want to switch over to the ministry side of things. Uh, some 31 years ago, I was called to serve as deacon here at Marystown and have enjoyed it tremendously, and then pastor and bishop for close to 20 years. And it's been, there's no congregation I would rather serve other than Myerstown. It's been a blessing, and, and we've enjoyed it tremendously. Anyways, we're, we're talking about an exit strategy here also. And uh, Keystone recommends that by the time you're 65, you should either have in place plans for an ordination or, or be already resigned. One or the other, retired, might be a good word. So... I started working on an exit uh, on an exit strategy, and I took it to the last September, talked uh, with the district ministry about it, and they gave their blessing. And a few months ago, I took it to Keystone Bishop Committee, and they gave their blessing. And so I just want to share preliminary plans with you all. And it's not happening tomorrow, but it's in the near future, sort of. And so I want you all to have time to think about it and pray about it. What we're looking at is uh, a bishop ordination for the district in August of 2024, which is, oh, wow, that's yeah, a year and a half away or something like that. And what we, the next step would be to take your council, and we want to do that, get your blessing in, the, in our spring council, which is spring of 2023, get your blessing, the three churches, and if we get that, then we will start laying plans for an ordination the following year, 2024, somewhere in the middle of the year, which will have me over the age of 65 and time to be turned out to pastor. So think about it, pray about it, and be prepared. We will be asking for your blessing for that at our spring council. There are a lot of questions in the Bible, and... We are familiar with many of them. A lot of sermons have been preached. Some of the questions, uh, I think of Cain's question to God regarding Abel. And uh, he's like, where's your brother Abel? And Cain responds, am I my brother's keeper? Books have been written with uh, using that as a title. Pilate's question to the crowd gathered at Jesus' trial. Many a message has been preached on... Uh, Pilate's, Pilate says, what shall I do with Jesus? And Pilate also, in Jesus' trial, says to Jesus, what is truth? And probably a question that many of us have, have pondered uh, in our lives, what is truth? Nicodemus said to Jesus, how can a man be born when they are old? And a lot of messages have been preached on that as well. This morning, my message title is a question from the scriptures, and it is the very first question asked in the Bible, what is it? Anybody? What's the first question that is asked in the Bible? The 
Excuse me? Very close. Yea, hath God said. Yea, hath God said. And it's who? It's Satan. Uh, Satan's question to Eve. Yea, hath God said. What's the second question in the Bible? We're on a roll. What's the second question asked? This is a question asked by God to Adam, right? Adam, where art thou? Notice the contrast in the two questions. Satan comes to Eve and he says, Yea, hath God said, he's he's, uh, interfering, if you will, or sowing seeds of doubt in uh, in Eve's mind about what God has has told her, and he's... uh, He's doing what Satan does. And on the contrast to that is God calling out to Adam and saying, Adam, where art thou? It's a personal question. And God was concerned about the spiritual condition of Adam. He knew where he was physically, but he was very concerned. And he was concerned. He, he knew what had transpired, but he was concerned about where Adam was. And he's asking, he's, he's asking about his, his personal relationship with the Lord. Where are you? And he was already thinking ultimately about a plan of restoration for Adam. And he was, he was in, in a sense, holding Adam accountable. And so what a contrast between Satan and God. And we see it in the first two questions uh, asked in the Bible. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3, where we find the first question. And as you're turning there, I might add that, you know, we, we have this, uh, or at least I do, I think most of us do, when we meet somebody, we have this common greeting, and it's like, uh, hi, Ray, how are you? Kind of like God to Adam. Where Adam, where are you? And I'm I'm inquiring, how how are you? How is it with you? And it's that we do it that much that sometimes it probably loses its we're it's just our go-to question, at least it's ours. And usually uh, Ray will, will respond, Oh, I'm fine, how are you? And oh, I'm good, okay. And then we we go on with our with our conversation. And so it's just something that that we do. And the, in, a, in a real good sense, it it's, uh, follows the pattern of, of God inquiring about the well-being of another person. And if you're like me, you have, I have to be careful because uh, sometimes maybe I have a, I have a really bad cold or, or I'm not feeling well is, is a fact. And somebody, oh, hi, how are you? And I'm, oh, I'm good. And I'm, oh, really, am I? You know, so I have to be careful to answer that question honestly. So here we are in Genesis chapter 3, and in the first verse, uh, it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made, and he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And just want to want to stop. I, this is the, the phrase that I want us to take home with us today, and I want us to be thinking about as we live our lives uh, this question that, that Satan confronts Eve with, because I believe it's a very, very important question, and I believe it's a tactic that Satan uses even in 2022, and I believe it's his favorite tactic and I believe that he just he uses it all the time. Uh, sometimes we can get uh, we think that Satan comes to us in very complicated ways, or that he has these strategies the, to trip us up or to keep us out of the kingdom, or like he's really this wise uh, person who who uh, spiritual being may, might be a better word that that just has these strategies that is. Uh, very wise and I want to present today that 
At times, yes. The Bible says he, comes, he can come as a roaring lion. He can come as an angel of light. He has all these different things. But I believe that what he falls back on most times is he comes right like he came to Eve and he says, yea, hath God said. My father was, uh, was one of those guys that could seemingly fix anything. And so I would often go to him for advice when it came to fixing something mechanical. And one of the things that he taught me, and I still use it today, I'm a person, I can overreact and something breaks or something happens and I'm like, right, I think the worst. Like, oh my, this is terrible. This thing, what am I going to do? This, this is, you know, this is horrible. And, but I'd go to my dad sometimes and I would say, you never guess what happened. This, you know, and I explain it and it's like, I, it's, I'm going to, this is going to need a new engine or this is, this is something serious. And my dad would always say, wait, stop. Let's think about simple things. Let's think about what could possibly have happened that would be an easy fix. You might be right, Lester, but let's think about the simple things first. And there were numerous times that he was right, and it was something so simple and, and it was so easy to fix, and I was like, oh my, this is complicated. And so I believe it holds true. The same thing holds true for Satan that we, we tend to overlook sometimes the very simple basic thing and way that he attacks us. And we think it's real complicated. No, it's not real complicated. See, uh, we are born again. We are born by, again by grace through faith. And faith is, is a trust in God. And so when, when you and I trust in God, we trust in, in what, every, what he tells us. It's true. We believe it. It's true. We take it at face value and we believe it. And Satan knows that. And so he loves to come after us the same way he came after Eve and says, hey, what about this? Just think about this. Does this really make sense? Is this really true? Does this make sense? And, and get us to questioning the things that God has told us. The first thing I want to notice about uh, this phrase, yea, hath God said, is the fact that Satan is not an atheist. Satan knows that God exists. Here he is to Eve. Yea, hath God said? He's acknowledging the existence of God. And you have so many people today running around, and, oh, I don't believe in God. There is no God. Well, guess what? Satan knows it and acknowledges it right up front. There is a God. And Satan's not an atheist. The other thing I want us to notice and think about is that who says something makes a huge difference. And, and Satan goes after Eve right away and says, did God say this? We all know, and you've probably heard me say this already, but I think it, it illustrates it so well when, we have, when you have children and maybe the oldest sibling comes and says, you hear the oldest sibling going to her, her younger siblings or his younger siblings and saying, we got to go pull weeds in the garden. And one of the siblings says, who said? Is this something you dreamt up or did mom say it or did dad say it? Who said it? And so it makes a big difference. Who said it makes a huge difference. And Satan goes after Eve and, and in the same way that, did God really say, did God really say this? Here we have in, in this verse, in chapter 3 of Genesis, in the first verse, we have one of the most difficult as well as one of the most important narratives in the whole Bible, in my estimation. If you look back at the last verse in chapter 2, it says, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Here we have a picture of perfection. We, we, can't, we can't even, at least I can't even imagine this level of perfection. Adam and Eve were made in perfection, and there they are. The scripture says they're naked and not ashamed. We can't imagine that today in a fallen world. Can't grasp it, how that would be. 
And in the very next verse in the scripture, here comes Satan and he attacks Eve with a question, yea, hath God said. And and Satan, uh, don't doubt it for a moment, Satan was setting out to destroy this perfection that Adam and Eve were enjoying in the Garden of Eden. He's going to destroy it is his intent. And his method of doing it is coming to Eve and saying, Yea, hath God said? What did this scene look like? Uh, According to Genesis 3.14, when the serpent was cursed, the Lord said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go. So most people believe that the serpent was standing erect when, when the serpent was talking to Eve. And I, they're probably right, can't prove it, but it would seem that way because the serpent was cursed to crawl on its belly after that. But maybe the more important question is, did Eve know who she was corresponding with, who she was communicating with? Did she know? Did she know it was Satan? Satan didn't come to her with horns on his head and, and, uh, and looking like sometimes we see pictures of the devil uh, you know, my, I, my thinking is that if he would have come to her like that, she would have immediately recognized him and said, yes, God really did say, I'm not, you know, I don't, not, not interested in communicating with you, but no, Satan comes in the form of a serpent who she's used to seeing in the garden, a uh, very common, uh, one of the creatures, animals in the garden and, and speaks through this serpent And so, in a sense, he's disguised. And she's like, uh, not thinking clearly that this is not really the serpent, that somebody is speaking through the serpent. And so, is it possible that in 2022, Satan reaches out to communicate to me and to you through other people, through neighbors, Siblings, parents, school teachers, pastors, college professors, uh, doctors, physicians, uh, politicians. Is it possible? Well, I believe if if Satan uh, did speak through a serpent, I believe he can also speak through other people. And it can be a kind of a scary thing. It's like, wow, how do we, how can we be aware of what's really happening well, actually, it's, it's pretty easy to detect if the voice that you're hearing is questioning the truth of what God has told you, we better be on high alert that this could very easily be Satan speaking through another person. Yea, hath God said. Any question that opposes uh God is, and and the truth of what he said is is something we should be very, very careful of of dealing with. I believe in in the last 7,000 years, Satan's tactics have really not changed, and so often he uses this method. Sowing seeds of doubt in the authority of God. Proverbs 9.10 says this. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And if you look at the word fear, it means, primarily it means reverence, but then it also means a dreadful fear. And so that is the beginning of wisdom to have a fear of the Lord or to have reverence for God. And if you want to, if you want to have reverence for somebody, it's important that we, we believe them and we have a relationship with them where we can trust and, and believe them. And that is exactly what God desires from us, is for us to believe him and trust him with our whole hearts. I believe that if we have and show a reverence for God, we don't need to fear him. If we reverence him, believe him, trust him. A few weeks ago, Uh, Some Canadian friends of ours were down to visit 
first time since COVID, and it's been uh, a number of years. It was good to, good to have them in our house for a few days and enjoyed our time together. And he was he's retired from the farm and is now working at a, a trailer factory where they weld uh, trailers that you would pull behind a vehicle and enclosed trailers, open trailers, what have you. And he was telling me how they have uh, like 90-some percent of their workforce are Mexicans, people that have immigrated from Mexico into Ontario and are working in the trailer factory. And so he's very few of them have any English. And so he, he walks around with his cell phone all day long with Google Translator. And he's the foreman on the, on the manufacturing line, one of them. He walks around all day long communicating with these guys with Google Translator. And, and he said, they are uh, just excellent employees. He said, they're hard workers. They love to work. They love their jobs. He said, it's uh, one of the most amazing things is that he said they get uh, the, the biggest, one of the biggest problems I have is if one of the lines is busy and I give some of the guys more hours because we need to get something done, the rest of them are jealous. They want to work more too. It's like, why can't I get more hours? I want to work more. Can I work in that line? Can they, they just want to work. And of course, a lot of the money is, is sent back to, to relatives in, in Mexico. He said that uh, one of the, one of the things, the other thing that happens is they show him such respect. He said, they're like, I'm not just Larry, I'm Mr. Larry. Everything's Mr. Larry, Mr. Larry this, Mr. Larry that. And he said, every once in a while, some, one of them will make a mistake and they come to me and they're like terrified. And they're just so, they're just distraught. They're all worked up. And I'm like, what's wrong? I'm messed up, messed up, you know. And he said, and so I, I'm like, oh, this is no big deal. I, and he said, I, I have to deal with the fact that they are so afraid that they're going to lose their job, that they're just all tore up. And I'm like, no, we're human. We all make mistakes. It's okay. We learn. We go on, you know. Oh, oh thank you, thank you. They don't want to lose their job. They're so... Uh, Anyways, my, I, I say that story to illustrate the respect that they have for their boss and the company and their job. There's no need to be fearful. Larry's like, I want these guys. I don't want, I don't, I'm not, they're great employees. I want them. They're hard workers and yeah, they make mistakes sometimes, but, but the respect is, is incredible. And so it works the same way. When you and I respect God, there's no need to fear him because of, of our respect for him. One of the, one of the ways that, that we show respect for God is that when the voices come and, and Satan comes and says, Yea, hath God said, yes, God did say. God said, it's true. God really did say. In... In chapter 3 and verse 1, we have Satan specifically asking Eve about this one restriction. He says, Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. He goes after uh, not, all the, not all the things they could do, but the one thing they weren't supposed to do. And Eve responds in verses 2 and 3. She, at, she has a little addition to, the, to what God had told them. And the woman said unto the serpent in verse 2, Ye may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Well, Scripture does not say that, that God uh, told Adam that he should not touch it. Uh, and so it seems like that is, is a little bit of an addition there uh, by Eve. But then in verses 4 and 5, Satan sets the trap. And he does it with a half-truth. Some of it's true, some of it's not true. Uh, and the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Oh my. Here Satan is, he shows his slyness by attacking Eve when Adam's not with her, and he's expressing surprise and doubt at this restriction. 
that God had placed on them concerning this one tree in the middle of the garden. He's like, oh my, is that right? Did God really say that? Huh, isn't that interesting? Well, the truth is, God really didn't. No, God. what God didn't tell you was that you're going to be like God's and you're going to know the difference between good and evil. God is withholding something good from you. That's the, the real, uh, that's really what Satan's saying. God's withholding something good from you. And God's not telling you the whole story. God's, uh, God's being just a little bit mean here. And, and, and if you, you shouldn't, shouldn't listen to what God told you because he's, he's withholding something good from you. And he tells Eve that you're not going to experience any harm in breaking this. In fact, you're going to experience good. It's all going to be good. Satan still tempts us that same way today. Satan tells us uh, the things that, er, everything that God tells us in the scripture, Satan comes and he says, yea, hath God said, you know what? It's not true. Satan says, there's, God's withholding good things from you. And uh, there's, it's just, you know, it's, it's just not true. One example I could give this morning is, is uh, in, in the area of, of moral purity. Satan is such a liar, and especially you young people sitting here this morning. I'll tell you, uh, what, what God says is true. What God says about moral purity is the very best thing for mankind. Very best. He wants the best for us. And Satan comes along, and we see it in in advertising in the world in which we live. We see it in the way people dress. We see it in the way the world, for the most part, is living. And and Satan says, you got to be kidding. I mean, this is 2022, and I mean, uh, how restrictive uh, to hold to to moral purity. And Satan tends to laugh at, at Christians for our stand on moral purity. And Satan just tears it down, does his best to tear it down. But the truth is that God not only means what he says, but it's the best for us. And many people who have fallen have suddenly discovered that, yeah, what God says is true. What Satan says and the way he tempts us is not true. And it's the exact same thing that happened to Eve here in the garden. She was what happened to Eve? Let's go to let's look at Genesis 3:13. This best describes what happened to Eve. In Genesis 3:13, after the fall, the scripture says, And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is it that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me. Do you know what the word beguiled means? It means to delude, to deceive, to lead astray. And if, if you were ever led astray, it's not a good feeling. Uh, you, you have your path set, you know where you're going, and someone leads you astray and you suddenly end up someplace you didn't want to be. And that's exactly what happened to Eve. She was beguiled by the devil. And she tells God, the Satan beguiled me. What a, what a tragedy. Perfect Eve was led astray by Satan. Today, children, all of us are born into this world with a sin nature because of the fall. And after we reach the age of accountability, we are in the clutches of Satan. 2 Timothy 2.26 says it so well. It says, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. And so when I read that verse, I think of an animal with its, with its foot in a foot trap. And you just can't. Yeah, you're, you're there, you're, you're living, but you are trapped and you can't get away. Every time you pull, it just it hurts and, and you're, you're trapped. And that is just a picture of Satan who has an unbelieving world in his clutches. And then, for those of us who have been born again, we are spirit-filled saints, but we are still under Satan's attack. He would love to have us back. We've we've been set free from that trap, but Satan still comes after us and still wants 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 to lead us astray as Eve was led astray, beguiled by him. 
And his primary way is, yea, hath God said. Is this really true? Did God really say that? In his question to, to Eve, Satan mixes a little half-truths in there and makes, him, makes Eve think that God's withholding something good for her. And today, I believe it, it often involves, uh, in a very similar way, involves lives, lies. It involves half-truths. It involves human reasoning. Well, how can this be? How can, uh, no, I'm sorry. If dad said pull weeds in the garden, dad means pull weeds in the garden. If God said, said it, it's true, and there's no reason to question it, it's true. And God said it. It's not somebody else saying it. God said it. The entire book, the entire Bible is spirit-breathed, and it, it's from the heart of God, and it's for our well-being. Now, I want us to think, I want to uh, just practically think of, of how effective Satan's tactics are and, and uh, think about some of the things that Satan has accomplished. Isn't it horrible to think about Satan's accomplishments? If you look around in the world today, we see Satan's accomplishments and so many of them come from Yea, hath God said. We're in Genesis. Go to the first verse. The very first verse in the Bible says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Brothers and sisters, God spoke into existence, and we read about it in the very beginning of the Bible, here in Genesis God spoke into existence the world in six literal days. He did it. The Bible says it. And if you want to think about Satan's accomplishments, think about the theory of evolution. How did that ever come to be? Satan went after people, went after very educated people in many cases, and he whispered in their ears and said, Yea, hath God said to cut? Did God really say that? I mean, really. I mean, just look around at the world. God created this, spoke it into existence. Why? It doesn't make any sense. I mean, really, uh, is there even a God? Wouldn't it make more sense that this happened over billions of years and you go all into the, into the theory of, of evolution? And... I want to make the point that people that, and there's a lot of people in the world that sadly believe in evolution, and as long as Satan can just hold them in that one error, he has them. One error. And it's the first verse in the Bible that states a fact that God created the heavens and the earth. God did it. And Satan comes along and attacks God in the very first thing he says in the, in the scriptures. You go on in Genesis chapter 1, and we could I could read the first three chapters of Genesis, and we could talk about so many things, but I just picked a few of them out to think about this morning. In Genesis chapter 1, let's go to verse 20, or I'm sorry, verse, yeah, verse 20. Chapter 1, verse 20. And in verse 20 through 25, he talks about uh, creating the animal kingdom. And then in, in verse 26 and 28, let's notice what those verses say. Verse 26, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. In verse 28, and God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air, over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. God made it clear in the first chapter of Genesis that man has dominion over the animal kingdom. God created it and man has dominion over it. Very clear. 
And we live in a fallen world that today so many people do not understand that, and it's because Satan has come along and has, has challenged that very truth that God has so clearly told us. The animal kingdom was created by God. We as mankind are to respect it and not to misuse it, and we are to appreciate it, and it's there for, for our nourishment, our enjoyment, if, you know, you can just go on and on. But we are to have dominion over it. It makes me sick today to read obituaries, and, and it's, it's just happening more and more. Forty years ago, you would have never read an obituary in the Lancaster newspaper where it would have said they are survived by the dog Puffy and this dog Jack, and, and, all, and it's, today it's so common it is so common, and it just, it's, just, it's just happening all the time. And I like dogs. Cats are sort of okay. Uh, you know, and, and I, I appreciate animals, but they are not human. They are our servants, if you will. We have dominion over them. They are not to be pushed in baby strollers uh, and, and talked to like their children, dogs. And I overheard recently two ladies talking, and, and the one lady says, oh, I have another grand dog, doggy. Oh, you do? Yeah, well, how many grand doggies do you have now? Well, I have three grand doggies. Oh, do they know you? Well, I think they do. When I come, they run around the yard. I think they know me. And it's like, oh, so. But do, but do you see what's happening? That passion and that love should be in the human race, not in the animal kingdom. We should love children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, not doggies. And, and so the, it's, it's not what God said. God said that we are to have dominion over the animal kingdom. I believe Satan takes a special delight today when he sees what's happening. And I believe he just delights in that and says, boy, did I mess these people up. They believed it. Another one we find in Genesis chapter 1 in, in verse 26, which I already read, is that we are made in the image of God. We, you and I, will live forever. We are eternal. We will live forever forever. The Bible's very clear on that, and you go read further in the Bible, and it's very clear that there are two destinies. Makes that very clear. Genesis 2, verse 7 makes it very clear that we are a living soul, which brings me to the sanctity of life. Life begins at conception. And today, Satan comes along and he says, Yea, hath God really said that human life is sanctified? Isn't this isn't this, uh, this child and that you, you've conceived and you're carrying a baby, isn't that an inconvenience to you? Why not abort it? And, and, and the, uh, the human might say, well, I, life is, is sanctified. Life, No, Satan says, hey, God's withholding something from you. God's not telling you everything. You could abort this child. And then you read horror stories of women who have had abortions and how the trauma that they deal with. And, and it's, it's not God's way. It's not what God said. But it's a way that Satan comes today and, and tempts humans and says, yea, yea, hath God said. Another one we find in Genesis chapter 1 in verse 27 where the scripture says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. It leaves no room uh, in this verse for all the, the variations of things we see today. Today we see homosexuality, lesbianism, and all kinds of, of gender confusion. None of it is sanctified by God. None of it. God hath said, I made a male and female. It's simple. We can easily understand that. It's not hard to understand. That's the way God made us. And Satan comes along. Oh, really? Well, suppose, but suppose you're a, a guy and you feel like a girl. 
I mean, you must be a girl because you feel like a girl, or you're a girl and you, you feel like a boy. I mean, really, the closest we ever got to this when I was a child was we, we would sometimes call girls, some girls, tomboys, uh, because they like to climb trees, then you were suddenly a tomboy. But that this has gone to a whole new level today where there's just gender confusion. People are so mixed up. And it is a tactic from Satan. Satan is coming and he's saying to people, yea, hath God said? I mean, really. And, and enter, enter into it with a lot of human reasoning and, and, uh, tr- and try and figure this out and figure that out. And, and well, you could, so you're a guy, you can change into a girl. Or you're a girl, you can change into a guy. Or you can have uh, polygamous relationships. And it just goes on and on. But the truth is, that God has said, he has spoken, and it's very clear, absolutely clear. And there's no, no reason whatsoever to question it. And when, when any voice says to you or I, yea, hath God said, yes, he has said. He said. It says it right here, and it's crystal clear, and there's no reason to doubt it. And also in Genesis chapter 2, in verse 24, uh, God makes it clear that marriage is between one woman and one man, and that marriage is, he designed it for uh, a, a helpmate for the man, and I, I can testify after 45 years of marriage that it works. It works. It really works. And it's God's plan. It's what he intends, and it works. And there is nothing better, absolutely nothing, Divorce is not an answer. It is not God's will. It's not in God's plan. And scripture bears it out. But Satan comes, so, uh, oh, hath God really said? Yay, hath God said? Question, question this. Think about it. Human reason. Yes, God hath said. And maybe one of the most important in, in Genesis is chapter 3, verse 15, where God promised, right after the fall, that he was going to send a Savior. Genesis 3.15 said, uh, this is God speaking to Adam and Eve, and he says, and I will put enmity between thee, or speaking to the serpent, and the woman, and between thee and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Here God is, is promising the world that he's going to send a Savior. He's telling Satan, yeah, you're going to bruise the heel of the woman, Yeah, Jesus is going to come. He's going to suffer. He's going to go to the cross. But guess what? He's going to be resurrected. And ultimately, he's going to bruise the head of the serpent. And the serpent is going to be uh, rendered powerless. And that's exactly what happened. And we have this beautiful salvation plan. We We understand the new birth, the new scripture. The New Testament lays it out so beautifully. And we as Christians, we get it because we experienced it. But Satan comes and he loves to come to unbelievers and he says, how could this possibly be? Did God really say this? Come on. How can a man uh, who lived 2,000 years ago and died on a cross, how could he be the savior of the world? Why, it doesn't even make sense. I mean, really, it makes no sense. But the truth is that God said it, God did it, and it works. And Satan can come with his questions all he wants. The truth is, there it is. It has happened, and it works. So Satan is a defeated fool, and his primary goal is to get back at God who threw him out of heaven, who, who uh, cast him down, And Satan is just this defeated fool who just wants to to get back at God. Sometimes he comes as a roaring lion, but more often than not, he comes masked as another person, somebody, we're, we're not thinking Satan, but brothers and sisters, when the question comes, when the when the question is, hath God said it's not from God? Because God did say. In Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 16 and 17 and 18 and 19, it says, These six things does the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, that's that's where Satan started with. That's what got him thrown out of heaven, pride, 
a lying tongue. He comes to Eve lying. Hands that shed innocent blood. Eve said, he led me astray. I was beguiled by Satan. A heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Feet that be swift in running to mischief. And a false witness that speaketh lies. And he that soweth discord among brethren. Brothers and sisters, those of us who are born again, there is no sweeter relationship that we have than our relationship with the Lord Jesus. And it is based on trust. We were born again because we trusted in him. We put our faith and trust in him. And Satan is a deceiver of the brethren, and he's a liar, and he's a thief, and he comes, he comes after us, and he just whispers in our ear, Half God said, yay, half God said, and he wants to communicate, he wants to dialogue with us. He wants to say, well, God did say, well, and then start a conversation. And my, uh, I really believe the best thing to do, the way to shut it down really fast as Christians is to say, yes, God has said, yes, God has said, it's done, it's finished, not even open for discussion. Eve decided to discuss it and decided to, yeah, well, God said and, and, and entered into a discussion with, with Satan. Satan starts, we have the Bible, which is full of facts. It's full of things that God has said from Genesis 1 to the end of Revelation. And this morning, we just, we just basically sticking to a couple chapters in Genesis and, and we see the attack that Satan has on mankind just from the very first things that God ever said in Genesis. Here's Satan just attacking on that. Well, guess what? We, you read on in the Bible, you get to Exodus chapter 20 and the Ten Commandments, and Satan understand, Satan knows the Ten Commandments too, and he attacks on them as well. Every one of them. Uh, just attack after attack. Half God said... Yes, the Ten Commandments are for my benefit. They're for your benefit. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor. And on and on the, the commandments go. Thou shalt have no other God before me for our good. And God said it. And Satan comes along tempting. What about this? What about that? Did God really say that? Does God really mean that? Yes, he really does. You go on to the very end of the Bible, the second to last verse in the Bible, Revelation chapter 22. Uh, Jesus says there, Surely I come quickly. I'm coming back. Jesus is coming back soon. And Satan attacks that. Hath God really said that? You really said, what a joke. Jesus is coming back? Yes, he's coming back. He said it. And so my point is that from the first verse in the Bible to at least the second to last verse in the Bible, Satan's just attacking, attacking, attacking. All, those, all Everything God has said. Yea, hath God said. But then when you get to the, to the very last verse in the Bible, uh, in, in Revelation chapter 22, the very last verse says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And that's what I want to leave with this this morning, that the grace of God would be with us all. And one thing I want you to take home is a very simple thing. It's very elementary but I believe it is profound and I believe it is something that will take us a long way in life. And when, when questions, no matter where you find yourself in life, if a question comes questioning what God has said, did God really say that? Did God really mean that? Yes, he did. Yeah, it's, it's, I read it right here. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God said this, God said that. That's the safe way to live. But our enemy will come after us time and time and time again with this simple little seemingly harmless question. Hath God really said? 
and we see what happened to Eve when she when she had a when she communicated with him and started a dialogue. Let's not even go there. Let's shut it down quick. God hath said. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you this morning for the word of God. And I thank you for uh, what it teaches us. And we see the tragedy that happened there in the Garden of Eden. And we see how it came about. All started with one simple question from Satan who disguised himself and comes to Eve. And we see the tragic fall. We realize that today that Satan comes so many times in the same way, tempting us and trying to lead us astray and questioning what God has really said. Help us to be people of integrity. Help us to be people that respect you and believe every word that you have told us and to simply respond, yes, God has said, and that's what the way I want to live and it's the way I'm going to live. Maybe I don't understand it all, but it's what God said and it's what I'm applying to my life and it's the way I'm going to live. Just ask that you would bless each person here this morning and help us to take this with in life and to uh, not give in to the wiles and the trickery of the devil. It's in Jesus' name I pray.